gonna walk past 40 tons of grass to come and grab this out of my hand. They're so dumb, but they're defiant at the same time. Dumb and defiant. My name is Jimmy Duresta and I make things for a living. We're here in my house in East Durham, New York. Uh, it's funny, Barry Katz has been a big inspiration to me. He's a TV movie producer from LA. He would always say, just be a good hang. And it's so simple. He, said, he always says, be undeniable and be a good hang. And just to be a good hang is what I would like people to think of me. Once I leave the room, I'm like, oh, that guy was a good hang. As opposed to being like, do you have water? Where's the bathroom? Is this fresh? You know, you know I don't want to be one of those guys. Yeah. No, it, Barry says it all the time. He goes, if you want to be successful in show business, just be a good hang. And it's just like that bee's nest in the backyard. No one goes near the bee's nest. No one goes to the side of the yard because they know they might get stung by a bee. When somebody has a bee's nest of an attitude, people just gravitate away from them. No, I think it's really, uh, it's an honor that people would call me the godfather. You know, it's every once in a while I think like, why, like, why do I get called the godfather? I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just because I share so much. I'm like maybe open to a fault. I'd rather be called the godfather than the asshole. This is a typical day here in the black barn. Taylor has that side of the room and I typically have this side of the room. Taylor, my girlfriend, makes chairs, beautifully handcrafted chairs, and her orders have been picking up, so she hired a couple guys to help her out. And production is picking up doing really well. But on a typical day, I work in here by myself on this side, and Taylor's on that side, sometimes with her assistance. When I was a little kid, I was always thinking about a more easy, more practical way. And as I got older, I kept thinking of a more practical way. For instance, if there was a line at the bank, I would always figure out how to cut the line without insulting everybody. I would always figure out a more interesting way to solve a problem. I'd always come in the back door. And the rooster's gonna accent every single thing I say. So ever since I was a little kid, I always kinda had that. And I feel that's been something that's carried through as I became an adult. Even now, like for instance, an example would be, you know, everybody's getting paid to take machines on YouTube. A lot of times I don't want to get paid. I just want the machine because I know I have the clientele where I can make a lot more money using the machine. So it's an easy deal for them, it's an easy deal for me, and I still make money. As opposed to trying to talk the company into giving me a $10,000 machine and a paycheck. I'll make the paycheck on my own more than they'll ever pay me. So I always try to make interesting, smooth type of deals like that. And coming up as a kid, I kind of had that same angle. It just kind of came natural to me. Not saying I'm a shyster or anything, but I always tried to figure out an interesting way to unpack a puzzle that nobody else was looking at it at that same way. When I, I bought this house, it's, uh, I originally bought the house itself with 17 acres, and this is the border of the 17 acres going down this tree line. It's long and skinny, and it had no barn. And I said, all right, it's a great piece of property. It's on a corner, it's a high up. I was like, I'll build the barn later. And then as I got, traction on YouTube, I started postulating and saying, I want to build a barn, I want to build a barn. And a friend of mine said, let's do a fundraiser. And that's when we made these stupid statuettes. I was a little embarrassed about that. I felt it was too premature in my evolution as a YouTube guy. Uh, anyway, but we sold about 30,000 of those. And that was sort of the beginning of me starting to put money aside. Long story short, 2017, we built the big black barn. But I always really wanted a post and beam barn. And when Taylor and I got together, she's like, a post and beam barn would be beautiful. So once the black barn was done, we started building this post and beam barn. 
and I didn't do anything except for pay for it. But. And you see barns up here, like out in the country, they're all sunk into the ground or they're all tilted and cockeyed. This foundation goes down like seven feet. So this barn will stay good for a long time. So what we have here, this is the wash stall. You can see there's a slot drain in the floor. This is where the horses would be washed. And there's the tack room and a bathroom and a shower stall right there. And then over there is the tack room. This is the center hall. And then over there in the weight room right now, that's the gym, that's the, that's the prison weight room we're using right now. And they were, they were kind of jammed into the container. I was like, let's just set them up out here. This way we'll use them once a year instead of never. Once a year is better than never. And these are, each one of these is going to be the horse, horse stalls. There's four horse stalls, 12 by 12. If we need to make them smaller for a mother and a baby, we got plenty of room. And upstairs is going to be a giant living space. So this is a dream come true, you know, we're, we're seeing it through. We just finally fenced in the corral for what would be for horses, but my neighbor brought over four cows, two steers, which are castrated bulls, and two females. And they're out there somewhere. Sometimes you call them and they come running. They're kind of cute. They're just like dogs, but giant. Moo! Moo! You know, I, I find that this is just a little bit of my own personal wisdom. I find it's better to get started than wait for the perfect time. And when it comes to that building and this building, Taylor and I decided to just, let's just get started. So same with this building. We had enough money to do the foundation. So we did the foundation. A year later, we built the frame. And now here it is almost a year later, we're building the roof. And hopefully the sidewalls go a little bit faster than that. But and all this time, I would have been waiting for the perfect time to do it, and then we would have started now, and it would have taken just as much physical time to build it as it's taking. But... So get started. People always wait for the perfect opportunity. I say just, just start somewhere. When I was in art school, everybody always said, you want to be an art director, you want to be an art director. And I always thought, interesting, I'm not sure what an art director does. Back then you couldn't Google it, you just have to ask different people what their opinion of an art director was. And an art director is somebody that directs the office, tells, you know, we, we're doing this client logo and I want you to do these things. The art director is the person that makes more important decisions and doesn't necessarily do the hard work. Right as I got out of school, I started working on an advertisement campaign and I started meeting advertising art directors. And I realized it's not the type of person I either want to be, nor is it the type of person I want to hang out with. So I was like, if this is going to be my career, I better figure out something to make it a little bit more interesting for me. Then I got into toy design. And for me, toy design was a lot more fun because instead of making props and making advertising props, which is how I would have worked with art directors. So whereas it's more of, you're the artist, you're the inventor, you're the curator of these collection of ideas versus working directly for an art director, doing exactly what they want for the client that they have. And you basically become a droid computer that can do what that person wants. Inventing, designing, developing toys, and further into life, YouTube, video, content, creation, it's all my thoughts, it's all my, they might not all be winners financially, they might not all be winners with a big audience or a lot of likes or a lot of views, but for better or for worse, the whole collection is all mine. It's all my thoughts. It's not me doing thoughts for an art director. It's not me expressing somebody's idea. Everything I, I express is all my own ideas. And I became very attracted to just always being the idea person and the idea executor. The nice thing about living right next door to a truck stop is you always have a place to eat, no matter what. It could be like two feet of snow on the ground, you go over there, have a cup of soup. It's really nice. It's the only place to go and get coffee and eat within 10 miles. This is the milk run, world famous milk run. Made it famous because a lot of the YouTube friends come from all over the world, Germany, Italy, and parts far beyond this area. And it's fun. It's just a great place to grab a bite to eat. Back your bags. I want a lot of them. Where are we going? I don't care where you go. Bacon cheeseburger. 
So I've been trying to eat a little bit more healthy over the year, but we're cheating today, as you can see. I wouldn't usually eat this. This is, would have been my meal every day last year. Since the beginning of the year, me, Derek, and Jocko have been doing a Monday weigh-in, just so we could keep track of each other's weight. Derek lost a lot of weight. Derek won. I lost about 15 pounds. Derek lost like 30 or 40. Jocko lost like three, I think. But it keeps us each in check. If it wasn't for my dad, I don't think I'd be here. Uh, in, in two dynamic ways. If it wasn't for my dad putting tools in front of me and, and unlocking that inner artist that I believe was here from the start. Um, and then also, my dad was also the example of, you need a civil service job, you need to do these type of things, and I didn't want that. So he, he, he worked for me in two ways. I did what he wanted me to do, and then I didn't do what he wanted me to do. That pushed me further in the direction of what he wanted me to do. So that's kind of my origin story. Um, if it was up to my dad, I would have been a fireman or a policeman. Still, right now, I could retire. And then you could start your career at 45 years old. You could retire, when, do your 20, and then start your job. But as a kid, I grew up in my dad's workshop environment, using tools, poking myself with chisels, and cutting myself on bandsaws, and learning the limitations of skin and bone, and learning how to use scrap material, hot glue guns, screws, nails. You know, it's funny when I see wood react a certain way or materials, plastic metal. I remember seeing my own experiments when I was a little kid in my dad's workshop. Well, a content creation for me started in exactly 20 years ago around this time of the year. My brother reached out to me who was out in L.A. working, trying to get on TV. He had already had a TV show. He did already had a couple of movies under his belly. He worked with De Niro up until that point. He had this idea for a show to pick garbage and make it into stuff, trash to cash. And so we pitched that show and in that meeting, the producer asked if I would be interested in being on the show. And so he said, why don't we do this brother thing where you become the maker or he, that wasn't a term at the time. He said, why don't you be the guy that makes stuff? And he said to John, you'd be the guy that's funny. And so that was our first foray. And that was also my first foray in my personal experience of working on camera. And so I did that show in 2002. And then a couple of years later, 2005, we did a show called Hammered that lasted through 2006. This is Jimmy. He's a master carpenter. This is his brother, John. We did a couple of little things in between, me and my brother. I did a couple of shows for HGTV that never went anywhere. And uh, in 2010, we did a really fun show called Lord of the Fleas based on videos that I made. And we did that show in 2011 called Dirty Money. We did 12 episodes, really fun show. Really, it looked, everyone involved was like, there's no way this is gonna be a hit show. And just like typical TV, they do one season and they just go cold on it for no real good reason. And so there, my younger, smarter girlfriend, Taylor, is like, why don't you, you put all this work into videos, why don't you just develop your own YouTube character, just do your own thing on YouTube. The one thing I did differently was I didn't like watching somebody talk to the camera. I just never ever listened to what they were saying. I would just fast forward through it, unless it was pertinent information. I came up with this style, which I didn't realize I was developing in the moment. I just said, I don't want to talk. And then I got flagged for some music, so I just stopped using music. So I just said, let's just let the tools run wild, whatever sound happens. And that's, that started to become my style, just running machines and just working super quick and showing the whole process. That was a long answer. My YouTube origin story was because I got mad at Discovery Channel. The ducks just hate everybody. Come on, come on. Wanna say hi? I think she's a, a lawyer from Long Island that was cursed and put inside of a turkey body. Come on, come on. Ah, God, God. Watch out! <laughs> The ducks hate people. So cute. Yeah, these guys were born just probably within a half hour of me walking into the chicken coop this morning at eight o'clock. So this was the vision. I made this in 2004. I bought the house, I built this a couple of weeks later with the vision of building it. So 2004, I started dreaming about a barn. 
It wasn't until 2017 that we built the Black Barn, and it wasn't until two years ago that we built this one. So that would have been like 2020 is when we started the, the horse barn. Because I can do a lot of things, and I could certainly build that barn if I focused on it, but I felt it would just consume my life learning how to build a barn. I'd rather just hire somebody else to do it and get the good content and share the learning. This is the compound. This is the house I bought in 2004. It's a farmhouse made in 1790. It's gone through a few different families and I've had it now for the last 16 years and it's really changed my life. I bought it not really knowing that I could either afford it or why I bought it or what I would do with it, but it's really become the centerpiece of my maker universe because I've had so many beautiful classes here. And then that led to what is now the Maker Camp and just so many friendships and, and so many great, wonderful learning experiences. It's, it's been amazing. The house might be haunted, but everybody leaves here with a good feeling. I think the house is haunted by good ghosts because nobody does anything mean. Occasionally I come downstairs and breakfast is already made without explanation. Banana pancakes. Just kidding, nobody's ever done that. Look at the cows. There used to be a set of stairs that came down from upstairs and they've been shut off. So that's where the ghost, that's the stairs the ghosts use. So this is a canoe that Nick Offerman and his team made. When he and I initially became friends, we worked on a how-to video for Bear Mountain Boats. That's how we all became friends. And while we were working together, he got the audition to do Ron Swanson. And it obviously became a huge, huge thing for him. And so, we made the video of the how-to on the canoe, and this canoe was done with a couple different techniques that were slightly different than the original one we shot. And so he did this at home, because he had to go back. We did the video in Brooklyn, but he did this in California, and the promise was he would give it to me when he was done. But in the five years he started and then finished it, he became famous as Ron Swanson, and since it was done right at the end of the final episode, they wrote it into the script. So this canoe is in the end of the last episode of Parks and Rec. This is the lucky boy. And at the time I was filming and shooting Nick doing all the canoe tutorials. My dog Lucky was, was always hanging around. I had a little Yorkie named Lucky and we called him Lucky Boy. And so when Nick said, what do you want to name the boat? We named him Lucky Boy. So when we did the Netflix show, the travel trailers, it was three, two fifty-three foot trailers along that tree line. One was the camera gear and the editing gear, and one was the office. And then there was a, a third big travel trailer that was all the bathrooms. The yard was a buzz with about 40 people every day. And we did the opening of the show right here when I was riding the, the tractor. It was a lot of fun. It was like complete chaos every day. It was fun. Actually, one of the producers brought a dog to the set and the dog mauled and destroyed a chicken right in front of everybody. It was a really funny day. Good times. I guess I have a fear of not staying relevant. Junior, come here. So I'm always trying to come up with something new. There's a little bit of pressure on me in this game. They all, this summer, they all like climbed up a sap tree or something. And all their furs got all lumpy, so I had to cut all their hair off. They all had like lumps in the same spot. They were going through some porthole somewhere in the universe. Because I'm the oldest one everywhere I go. Every event that we've ever been at, I'm probably by far the oldest person in the room, like Workbench Con. Is there anybody at Workbench Con older than me that you could think of? <laughs> you know what I mean? There's a little bit of a fear of staying relevant, so I'm always trying to partly jokingly try new products. Be like, oh, would it be funny if I made coffee? <laughs> Maybe this will work. Would it be funny if I made a coffee mug? <laughs> Maybe this will be the one. Wouldn't it be funny if I made a nice pick? Oh, that, that's working. Oh, let me make a razor blade for fun. It's like, oh, it's selling. So it's me kind of having a little bit of a sense of humor with product development. As a YouTuber and influencer, I could just come up with a stupid idea and see and see 50 of them. And if people like them, they sell, and then we start to improve the product. We start to embellish it and see if it goes anywhere. I'm kind of focusing more on my brand, my long-term goal, it's like a graffiti artist. I just write my name on enough shit, enough times, that people will start putting it on sneakers and paying for it and they don't know exactly why. They just know that if they don't, they won't be cool. That's my branding theory.
This is the room full of shit I really don't need, but I need. But I don't need it. But I need it. It's called the sickness, is what it is. My buddy Stu found this for me. This has got to be well over a hundred year old fly press. Now because of my OCD I have to finish cutting the entire piece out. This is just a laser cut piece of plastic. Ice pick just kind of came out of nowhere. I started making them for myself and using them to clear pathways on the CNC machine or pick up a, something I dropped or whatever. It's just, I always say it's like a single pointed, uh, the ice pick is just like a single, it's a knife with a single point. You use it for everything. You, know, you could use it as a fork, you could cut open a letter with it and you'll find you can clean your fingernails with it, pick your teeth with it. There's like so many things that people do with it in a day. It just started to develop. Again, going back, it has kind of a sense of humor. And the razor blade has a sense of humor. It's like functional, absurd, oversized art. It's a real good feeling to go to an event that we would drive to most often and see everybody with the ice pick sticking out of the top of their pocket. I mean, it is really, it really makes me proud and I feel accomplished. It's funny to identify my fans to see. And then you have the occasional fan, they go, what is an ice pick for? Why do I need an ice pick? And then I give them one and they're like, oh, I understand why I need an ice pick. I'm sorry about that bird, he won't shut up. My name's Rob Rojas, I work here with Jimmy Duresta and I make the ice picks. So let's start off with the ice pick itself. We can grab an ice pick without any stamps on it and we'll bring it over to the stamping machine. Slots right in here. That'll stamp the Duresta logo into the ice pick. Then once the ice pick is stamped, we can polish it up. And that's our completed polished ice pick. Now onto the sheath. First we'll grab some brass stock from the rack. Next we'll cut our stock on the bandsaw, the length. Next we're gonna do the crimp. Next we do the dink. We'll sand a flat spot on a ring first. Put it in our soldering jig, line it up, and we'll solder that together. Once our joint is soldered, it's pretty dirty, so we want to wire wheel it. Next, we need to slot the ice pick to make the spring action. That'll hold the sheath onto the ice pick. Then we do our final polishing on a blue scotch bright belt. There's a special ice pick that's a little bit thinner so the spring cannot grab on the ice pick. Once our two parts are complete we can put them together and that's your completed ice pick. I'm stuck on that every Saturday thing. That started during COVID. Prior to that, I put out a video whenever I felt like I was done with my next video. But COVID got me on the schedule every Saturday and I kind of like it. It's kind of an interesting exercise. It's like every Monday morning I wake up, I'm like, five days from now, I'm gonna publish a video. I'm not exactly sure what it's gonna be. Let me open my notebook and figure out something to focus on. And it's, uh, it's a great personal challenge that I really enjoy. My schedule is <clears throat> my schedule is all day long making things and doing stuff, and but I, I always have an ongoing list, and and there's no end of the day, so there's no time to go to dinner. 
Let's make, I mean, Taylor has the same schedule as me. She just randomly works all day long on everything. But we find that fulfilling. I typically go to bed around two o'clock. My phone sets a reminder to go to bed at 2 a.m. And I don't really feel guilt and shame until about three o'clock in the morning. That's when I feel you're, you're a waste of life if you don't go to bed soon. But I get up at about seven, eight o'clock every day. So I sleep between four to five hours a night. I pay 30 bucks for the blade charge $100 for each one of these. If I didn't, never had to eat and I never had to sleep, that my life would be better. Like if there was three wishes, one of them would be to have endless cash and the second one would be I would never have to eat or decide what to eat again and the third one would be that I would never have to sleep. Those would be my three wishes. Well, last summer I, I cleaned up the porch. I ripped off the old porch on the house last summer and he was underneath it. And as the fable goes, Taylor was up here alone about eight years ago. She spent the weekend up here alone doing some gardening and stuff in the summer and she found this guy eating her like rose bush or something. And she called me, she's like, I just killed a gopher. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, I saw him eating. He kept coming back and eating this plant of mine. And I got the 22 out. We have this old cowboy rifle and she shot him from the porch window, from the kitchen window through the porch. And she's like, I shot him on the first shot and he ran under the porch in the front. And where she described it eight years ago, where he ran, is exactly where I found this guy. So this has got to be the guy. And when I pulled him out, I said, well, look what I found. She's like, oh my God, that's the guy I shot eight years ago. So to redeem Taylor and to honor this little guy's life, and just to show all the other gophers they shouldn't be eating anything around the garden, we'll hang this up. So there's the spine, it should live like right there. This is a 1920s iron worker and it has three stations on it, punching holes, just like if you're on a train and they punch a ticket, that took. this is basically what that does, but it punches holes in half inch steel or three quarter inch steel. You can punch a square hole, a round hole, depending upon the die that you put in it and the receiver and you put it between it. And then over here, you have the ability to shear up to quarter inch angle iron, as long as it'll fit in there. So if you have angle iron steel, you stick it in there, you step on the pedal and it just cuts it. Cuts it square or cuts it at an angle, whatever you need it for. And then it, ow! Then at the end, come look over here. This is my favorite part. This is basically like a pair of scissors. And just like a pair of scissors, you can keep going like this and moving deeper into the material, whether it's paper or fabric. You can take a piece of, piece of five eighths, eight, five eighths, that makes me lisp. A five eighth inch piece of steel, as long as you want. And you can just keep feeding it in and it'll scissor it apart. And it'll go down that part of the machine and down that part of the machine. It's pretty amazing. The idea of me buying something before I even know anything about it comes from watching my dad agonize over making decisions growing up. And uh, like I said, I just seen too many people, including my own family, say, I can't do that, I don't have the money. I don't always have the money either, but I would prefer the experience and then go bankrupt and deal with it later. 4,000 pounds, how would you live there? Why? Because it's there. And it's going to be a beautiful machine that people are going to come from far and wide to touch and look at and to see operate. So this is the racetrack property. It's two acres. It was a mini carnival with a mini golf right here. And then it has the go-kart there. There was a mini go-kart for little kids. It just was a big oval. And then there was a roller coaster here. And then batting cage, that was that big square is the batting cage. I picture about a 6,000 square foot building 
taking up that entire corner of the property. And then three big bay doors that we could drive in and out of with my antique car collection and all my antique trucks. And the whole front property kind of paved just to do what I want with it. And then that front building, I'm gonna try and maybe keep the track as long as possible. In all actuality, the track property is the best spot to put a building, but I feel bad getting rid of the track considering that's why I bought it. Hi, Mom. This is my release form for people that come to track day. If they don't read this, they're not allowed in. We're gonna go across the street and get the pizza oven that I built with first build. You know, failure, a, it's a funny thing Thomas Edison once said, failure because that's just something that just wasn't meant to be. Now you know what not to do. Failures are just things that weren't meant to happen. And as opposed to being like, oh, I failed at my little gene business or this or that. You, know, you, you jump into a venture and you know what it takes to do it. And then when you realize it's not what it takes, it's not what you want to do. It's like dating people. You know, when you're looking for a lover or somebody to spend your life with, you meet all these different people, and you're, what you do is you're really realizing you're meeting all the people you don't want to be with. And failure and product success is the same thing. Failure or success and products is the same thing. You're like, well, I guess I just wasn't meant to be the gene maven. I still have some good ideas. I could implement them somewhere down the line. I could license some of my ideas. Maybe my name will mean so much someday. It doesn't matter what the gene is. The name could make the gene sell. So there's always still opportunities when it comes to failed products. You know, outside of losing physical mobility or your health, any big failure is, is that big of a setback. I think it should always be a learning experience to move to the next level. I'm almost fit. You don't hear any of this horrible country music outside of this place ever. I think all this horrible music is written specifically to play inside Dracula Supply. And the people that work here, they like pipe them in from the south. I never saw anybody local to this neighborhood that works here. They must because they are here, but they all seem to have southern accents. It's strange. And we're in upstate New York. I've always been very open. Being a New Yorker, I think, is a big part of being completely accepting of everybody and everything. It, 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 as a New Yorker, being jam-packed in a city with so many different people, different types of people, and it's just like you're standing on the corner and then you, as a New Yorker, you're instantly in a conversation with a complete stranger about something you both just witnessed. And it's like instantly you're friends for those few seconds, and then you go on your way. You don't need to know each other. And I think that's helped me throughout the world. If somebody walks up to me, I just immediately assume that I know them. Even though I don't, I assume this, oh, hey, what's going on? Not like, uh, can I help you? Like, when I see people do that, that just shuts it. And I go, hi, what's going on? How are you? I pull people in and it starts the conversation. Cameras, just what I need. I promised myself though I'd only collect serif face letters. See Rob, these are sans serif. What kind of, oh you can mark leather with them, right? What else can you mark with them? Oh anything. I mean as can long as they're hardened. Them? Yeah, as long as they're hardened. We're at the Creekside Flea Market. I've been coming here ever since I bought the house. 15 years. And like I said earlier, I like to shop with my eyes mostly. So I come here 
looking for ideas, things to emulate, things to improve, things to make. But in our community, I just love the idea that people want to know knowledge, people want to share knowledge, people are curious about what I do and other makers and other YouTubers. And I need to keep one of these in my wallet. I'm just, I'm honored that they're curious. I'm honored that they support me. I'm honored that they support this community. So I'm more than willing to see the community continue to grow and, and help in my own way. So nowadays we have rolls of packing tape. This would have been, maybe you might consider this a roll of packing tape in the turn of the century. It's called the crate hammer. It's for opening up crates and nailing them shut. So when things were shipped back in the day, they were always shipped in a wooden crate or in a barrel. And this is what you would open and close it with. Mostly wooden crates, called the crate hammer. Sometimes I buy things just for the texture of them because they look good in the video. It has a lot of history to it. You put your pee pee in there. This is gonna be those knives. This is a big one. It's hard to find the bigger, bigger one. This is like about as big as they go and then after this they go to like 52 inches, which is too big. My name is Austin Handel. I am the manager supervisor here at the Blackthorn, and I'm also the curator of the Catskill Mountain Maker Camp. The reason I like the maker community is because it's like a network, a vast network. Whether I'm in England or whether I'm out west, I can get on Instagram and say, I have a flat tire. Can anybody help me? I've never had to use that, but I know no matter where I am in the world, somebody would come and help me fix my flat tire. Uh, so Jimmy and I met, I think it was probably 2018. Um, his shop was right across the street from uh, my family's go-kart track that Jimmy now owns. I had the idea for Maker Camp back when I was in college. Uh, I met Jim and I told him my idea and he supported it 100%. Uh, we had a meeting and uh, he said, yeah, this could totally happen. And uh, he, he kind of put me in touch with the right people to, to get it off the ground and it's kind of just blossomed from there. I think the Maker community is, is wonderful in the way that we all want to help each other. Doesn't matter what click you're in, doesn't matter what vibe you're in, anything. I think we all really want to help each other. And I've been told that I'm so helpful in sharing of information that it inspires other people to do so. So that, that's a big win for me. I think like our ultimate goal is to build the build the maker community. And I would love to make Blackthorn, my, my home, a, a kind of a landmark for makers to, to come visit and like see the work of other makers and uh, you know bring back your family 20 years from now and say I, I helped build this uh, back when I was, you, you know, you kind of get what I'm saying, kind of create a, a, a maker's legacy in the town of East Durham. Of course, of course everything I'm doing is fulfilling and it's nice to see, one of, one of the most fulfilling things is to see a fan come up to me and have a conversation saying, I really love what you do, I would love to be able to do what you do, but I this and but I can't, but I that, but I have family, but I this. Come get it. Yo. And then I get to see them again, or they write me a beautiful note and they say, you know what, I've, I've stopped drinking because you inspired me. Or I now focus on what I really want in life. I still have that job, but you know what, it's pleasant to go to because I know I can come home and do these other things that you've inspired me to do. I mean, talk about fulfilling, that's like really, that really warms my heart. And it's nice to see other people be fulfilled and inspired by what I've been able to leave behind. Oh, I, there, there's, there's nobody in the world like Jimmy Duresta as far, as far as helping other people and like facilitating other makers into finding uh, kind of their, their spot in the maker world, that Jim's the man for that. The man is a master of not by what he creates, but how he inspires. He's a master because he's willing to pass on tribal knowledge. And that's exactly, I'm getting emotional, that's exactly what you guys are doing here. And this is a beautiful thing. I can't, I've lost count of how many people have told me that this was life changing for them. It was life changing for me.
I think success is not ever having to deal with an art director and still making a living. So does the rooster. I think success is being able to do what you want, when you want, how you want to do it, with very limited opinions. I mean, we share our lives with our spouses, whoever they might be, and there's a compromise. Bills are mostly paid. I have the ability to daringly take chances on building things and buying things that are going to help me build things. And, uh, you know, people look at my life and they constantly say, man, you're really living the life. And I've worked so hard and I still work so hard. I have to like, am I really living the life? And, you know, it wasn't until these last like couple of years I'm like, wow, I'm really proud of the life that I built for myself. And when people say, how are you? I say, I have absolutely nothing to complain about. Nothing. And I think that success is when you have absolutely nothing to complain about. When I need to complain, I call Derek. Oh my God, uh, Jimmy DeResta, like, he's just like the original maker that I found on YouTube to, that just, I mean, he does it all. He's amazing, he's so inspiring to everyone in the community. Jimmy is the best. Jimmy's my favorite. Big inspiration, Jimmy. Love what you do. I love you, Jimmy. I'm obsessed with you. Jimmy, I love you. Cheers it up. Where are your dryer sheets? I couldn't find any dryer sheets. Jimmy's the best. He inspires all of us. Jimmy, thank you for being you and for inspiring a generation of makers. I love you. Jimmy, I just really want to thank you for being the uncle that so few of us had and making this like literally none of us would be here without you so we so appreciate who you are you're the most generous loving giving person in this community and uh shoot you've changed all of our lives for the better oh my god i'm crying and i'm talking to a plastic statue hey jim thanks so much for having us this is such a great event it's really great to see so many people being creative and connecting and sharing so this is great thank you give him a hug thanks for the 3d printer jimmy i love you jimmy you're great. I want to have your babies. Always a pleasure to come here. This is such an amazing uh, thing that you've done, uh, bringing this community together. We really appreciate it. And uh, just wish you many, many years of uh, prosperity and growth in this endeavor. Love you, brother. What people don't know about Jimmy is he actually has a third nipple. I love you, Jimmy. Hey Jimmy, thanks so much for being such a huge inspiration to our family, our business, and ourselves as individual artists. Yeah, you've inspired us in so many different ways along this whole community, and uh, we love you. Ryan, if I say something, Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy, you know I love you. Yeah. I even share my coffee with you. But no, you've changed my life for the better, and I just want to thank you for everything you have done for me and my family. Yo. Jimmy, you're always such a continuous inspiration, and it's great to be in your neck of the woods for things like epoxy animals. But honestly, thank you for being such a big part of the Maker community and putting together and being an initial innovator for the idea of Maker Camp. It's remarkable. Thanks, man. Thanks, Jimmy, for always being the center of the Maker Brain and making it so that the rest of us can learn from your wisdom, uh, always sharing your skills, and always being willing to answer the really dumb, weird questions that I sent you. Right. No, well, thanks, Jimmy, for getting me started making stuff and documenting my stuff on YouTube. It was your, your fault, so thanks. Jimmy, thank you for being the kindest, most humble guy. You ever, you give everyone all the attention they, they crave. <laughs> thank you so much for everything you do in the maker community. Jimmy, this is incredible, dude. Here from Canada, we love it and uh, love chatting with you every week, dude. And dude, thank you for everything. Thank you, Jimmy, for everything that you've done. I literally wouldn't be here without you. You've been such a great support and such a great motivator and helped me through so much. You're a great friend and an inspiration as a builder and a creative person. You've done so much for everybody and you've inspired me to, to try to follow in those footsteps. So thanks, man. You're the man. Jimmy makes me want to make stuff. 
So we are so stoked that Jimmy and Austin have started this. It is just such a fun area for makers to get to know each other and connect. And that is what Jimmy is all about, just connecting and he never does not have a moment to spend with everybody that wants to talk to him. We love you. Uh, thank you, Jimmy, for always being a pillar of the community, a good friend, always helping out, good guy. Thank you. Uh, thank you for always supporting me in all of my endeavors with Epoxy, um, and I appreciate everything that you've done. You're the best. When I met Jimmy, I, wa I met him from watching his videos online, and I saw the way he was living his dream, and I said, I gotta, I gotta meet this guy because <laughs> he's living exactly how I want to be living. And I finally did meet him because I knew his father, and now my life has changed and I'm living my dream. And it's really, it started with Jimmy. He introduced me to all these beautiful people and my life is enjoyable now, it's fun, it didn't used to be. And I, I owe that to Jimmy. He really, it was meeting him, he opened a lot of doors for me, introduced me to a lot of people. Now these people are my best friends. And thank you, Jimmy, it's all because of you. Um, the way you welcome people in is super special and it makes all of us feel special and part of this community, which is what we're all here for. So thank you so much for everything you've done. I really appreciate uh, you know, the inspiration you've given me. Thanks a lot. I went to Maker Fair many years ago. There was a very kind person cutting things out in a bandsaw. Um, I was there with my niece, we observed, we chatted, uh, and it was you, uh, and we've stayed connected all these years, and I'm really grateful that I'm now here at Maker Camp. Uh, I just taught seven classes to really amazing people. I've spent days talking to amazing people, and none of this would have happened without the, my connection meeting you at Maker Fair and then all these years of just adding other people and I'm really grateful to call you a friend and I am actually constantly inspired by you and I hope you keep doing what you do so we can all do what we do. He's just a, a good guy for bringing people together and teaching and sharing the knowledge which I think is super important. Hey Jimmy, what's going on man? I just wanted to hop on here and say thank you for putting on this show and for inspiring all of us. You know how much you mean to me how much you inspire me. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you and keep rocking it. Jimmy is the absolute best godfather of make that you could possibly want. He is the absolute best ambassador of make that you can imagine. He is He's not only a good friend, but he is the guy that you want out front representing the things you do. Jimmy? Thank you for your generosity, thank you for your infinite knowledge, and thank you for the love and support. I have no regrets not becoming an art director. I'm glad that I am a freestyle artist, free to do whatever I want, free to make and burn whatever I choose. The short answer is my greatest accomplishment is this house and my YouTube channel. You could put that answer in place of all that other shit.